Hi, a very warm welcome to all our viewers. We at NASCOM have embarked on the NASCOM Cloud Advocacy Program to engage with the cloud ecosystem through conferences, regional connects, research papers, and advocacy programs. Under the ages of this program, we have planned a series of government and PSU roundtables of thought leaders, technocrats, and cloud practitioners to discuss on their take on the sets of challenges and opportunities in the current cloud ecosystem. My name is Vibhu Jham, and I welcome you all to this particular fourth roundtable on uh, cloud advocacy. It's my great privilege to introduce today's panel of esteemed stature and unequivocal competence in their respective field. The theme of today's discussion is leveraging cloud to enable transformation for public sector. This is the fourth virtual roundtable in a series of discussions, and joining me in this discussion today is Mrs. Ashwini Bhide, IAS, Additional Commissioner, Municipal Corporation of uh, Greater Mumbai, MCGM. She has a rich experience of about two and a half decades in IES cadre, and she has held key positions such as CEO in Zilla Parishad, Additional Divisional, uh, Divisional Commissioner, Joint Secretary to Gover Governor of Maharashtra, Additional Metropolitan Commissioner in Mumbai Metropolitan Regional Development, MMRDA, Secretary in uh, School Education and Sports and Managing Director, Mumbai Metro Rail Corporation Limited. Mrs. Bide has been working in uh, Mumbai Municipal Corporation as additional commissioner in charge of Eastern Suburbs since May 2020 and is responsible for execution of Mumbai Coastal Road Project. She looks after education, fire services, gardens, information technology, as well as building construction and maintenance department of PMC. She has BMC's COVID-19 uh, war room for more than a year now and has been responsible for BMC's COVID daily uh, COVID-19 dashboard. A very warm welcome to you, madam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Kanishk Agiwal, uh, Head Service Lines India South uh, South Asia at Amazon Internet Services Private Limited. Kanishk heads AWS Service Line India and South Asia with focus on digital innovation and deep tech such as AI ML, analytics, quantum computing, HPC, IoT, as well as AWS service offerings as databases, storage, edge, hybrid cloud, and security. At AWS, he works with the public sector, central governments, state governments, education and health sector, not-for-profit organizations, travel and transportation industry, and PSUs to drive AI at scale for citizen impact. Kanish, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you, Vibhu. I would like to begin by asking you, Madam, uh, how as a cloud technology has impacted the operations at uh, BMC, especially in regard to offering large scale public services? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, BMC, you know, it is uh, one of the largest municipal bodies and it uh, governs one of the largest metropolises uh, in the entire world with uh, more than 12 million population. Uh, BMCs, if you see, look at the roles, it can be divided into three different compartments. They have to uh, collect taxes, so taxation is one role. Then BMC has a regulatory role where the land use uh, is uh, governed by and uh, even the building proposals and all uh, that falls in that. And BMC also has a developmental role where all citizen services uh, are uh, combined, so they come in that vertical. And the scale of operations which BMC does is huge. If you Look at uh, the almost daily 4,000 MLD uh, water supply is made, 1,500 uh, MLD sewage is treated, 6, 7,000 uh, metric ton of uh, solid waste management is done. Plus, we have almost more than the 100,000 uh, people as uh, employed with us and dealing with this population. So, looking at the scale and complexity of all these operations, because many of these operations are, many of these activities are repetitive, they are in a flow. So looking at them, uh, there is no other alternative but to have a very robust uh, technological backbone and uh, an IT platform. And that is why BMC started investing in this uh, technology uh, about uh, 15 uh, years back, mainly the IT technology. And uh, we started, in fact, we, BMC probably would be the first of its kind municipal corporation, which is on an ERP platform. So we invested in ERP in 2007. And in addition to that, uh, there are each and every department started uh, looking at IT as one of the tool for uh, citizen service uh, provision. So taxation department would have 
uh, online uh, taxation services so the you can pay your property tax water tax all other license fees and so many other payments user charges development charges online then all the various online services were started we had a citizen facilitation center where online services multiple online services were offered in addition to that we have a very strong uh, gis platform because the disaster management uh, uh, function of bmc the rescue function the fire department's function these are also very critical so we have a very strong disaster management control room we also have a fi uh, for fire uh, con command uh, control center so all these uh, things basically uh, created our uh, uh, it ecosystem uh, for bmc and it generated huge uh, data so uh, once the data is there then storage its management security all uh, those issues we had to manage so initially we started with uh, the our own uh, on premise uh, data center at worli uh, in 2007 itself after that we realized the limitations of that because as, as our operation scaled up then the issues of scalability security uh, elasticity all those things came up and we thought uh, cloud platform is a better option which provides uh, all these things and therefore we uh, shifted to a cloud platform and that time all the erp uh, operations as well as non erp operations were on the same cloud platform later on we further uh, you know uh, devised our policies so as we upgraded our erp platform then at that time we the uh, the system integrator only was given the responsibility to get a proper uh, cloud service for us so with aws uh, we started putting all our uh, erp related applications on that then for non erp revenue generating applications we had another uh, cloud service provider which we procured through dit's empanel list and then we also retained our uh, data center at worli for non erp non revenue generating operations so it's a hybrid model we started uh, working and that has helped us a lot it has given us uh, the necessary uh, efficiency flexibility uh, and co control on the whole system and since this is a very ro robust base which we have uh, set up now we can you know escalate further we can uh, go for uh, some new um, kind of applications also because currently we are having this infrastructure as uh, system the iaac but we also would probably go for the platform based and the software uh, based systems because now our current chatbot or the application uh, our uh, uh, app also they are uh, moving towards uh, that direction so probably technology has really helped bmc uh, to be more uh, you know citizen centric because in this whole process of complex citizen service we have organization on one hand uh, our employees on the other hand and citizens on the um, third uh, that is the third arm so organization needs to be very trustworthy efficient uh, citizen centric the employees need to be motivated and because th these kinds of scenario don't find in a public uh, sector but if you have to be at par with private sector and in terms of the quality of uh, service in terms of the time sensitivity of the service then we need to uh, adopt on this and that's what we have done and the cloud platform and the technology adoption has helped bmc to uh, maintain its edge and always be competitive vis-a-vis -vis the other service providers that is really really nice uh, good to hear that uh, ashwini ma'am uh, mentioned on the hybrid cloud and kanish i want to bring you into the conversation now and my question to you is that you know there is a compelling case that, you know, just like madam actually said of being made of hybrid cloud being made there now and there are obvious benefits to it how do you think governments can leverage the power of hybrid cloud just like mcgm did um, so you know, one one I, I really think MCGM case in general is a is a classic case of how an on-prem application has slowly migrated onto the cloud, right? And as you look at through any cloud migration journey, it's not a one-step journey. It is a step function. You will have applications that first need to be re-architected or modernized before they move onto the cloud. You will have certain applications that just can't move onto cloud because of multiple reasons. You know, it could it could be data residency. It could be latency, it could be security, it could be just the entire at local point processing requirements that you may have, or just humongous data transfer uh, charges that you'd be hit if you've transferred all of that data onto cloud because you're just leveraging that. And this, I think, becomes a part of any organization strategy, more importantly for public sector organizations. Because of the kind of data that public sector organizations really sit on, and then that they're governed by the local laws, uh, whether it is around data localization or any other specific 
uh, laws that they need to be conforming to, uh, it is important for them to you know adapt and appropriately bring a hybrid strategy in place. But once you've moved to a hybrid strategy, there are certain steps that need to follow. And I think you know MCGM has definitely done that over the period of last six, seven years, as we've seen. Uh, but as, you know, similarly, other organizations also follow this, which is number one: Have you got your hybrid cloud strategy in place? You know, which parts of the application actually move on? Which parts continue to stay with you? What is your roadmap for the next five years as you migrate all of this through? Uh, what is the impact? Do, are you doing this because you're in a migration journey? Are you doing this because you need an uh, a DCDR sort of a response that is an emergency resilience backup center that you put up and therefore you put up a hybrid strategy? Are you doing this for near term latency requirements? Are you doing for re data residency requirements? So once you're clear of what is the end goal that one is trying to serve, then that becomes the base of your strategy and that defines everything else after that. The next part of which, is, which we call is our technical strategy piece, right? Which is you have the developers, they don't want to be working on different systems. So you don't expect them to be working on a on-premise uh, interface, which looks very different from a cloud interface. Uh, so they want to be working on a very similar toolkit, a very similar API middleware layer that they're working on. Uh, they want to actually also build once deploy anywhere. So they don't want to be building for one system at let's say a hybrid, you know, an on-premise data center and then build another one for the cloud. It's just a lot of duplication of work. So you bring all of that together. Um, and then which is the industry that you're catering to? I think that also underpins a lot of this discussion. Um, if you're doing, let's let's take an example for Agri Land Records, right? And there is a district Tessildar who wants all of these records at his beck and call. There is there is a general problem of internet in the in the village. He, you know, we are probably looking at 100 Mbps lines, but the poor guy is, you know, at best, man, he gets a 144 Kbps or he's on a 3G network. So how do I make sure that which industry am I serving uh, and what parts of my uh, strategy needs to be near term? Think of oil rigs. Uh, there are a ton of uh, high high sea oil rigs that are very far away. Again, they have a latent, latency requirement uh, or an issue coming in. So can I actually start solving that? That becomes a third part of your strategy. And then finally, once you've got all of this in, is the piece that you stitch around the security layer, the data processing layer, the controller layer, to start bringing all, all of that in so that at all points in time, your both on-prem as well as your cloud environment are at par as far as security is concerned, as far as resiliency is concerned, because like that you know, famous saying goes, right? The chain is just as strong as the weakest link. Uh, so you don't want it that, you know, you have your hybrid cloud strategy or your hybrid cloud security be at different levels across these two, uh, you know, uh, on-premise as well as what you have on the cloud. So I think putting all of that together, that's where we've seen most public sector organizations innovate and build in a hybrid cloud strategy. Uh, it is important to recognize that this is here to stay. You know, there will be certain parts of this, um, you know, you'll never have a situation where I can say, okay, well, you know, all our organizations will be 100% on cloud and vice versa. You will have to find a middle ground. And I think that's where, uh, you know, for I, I would give kudos to MCGM for uh, getting that middle path so finely defined. Right, fine. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Kanishk. Uh, Madam, my next question to you is, uh, you know, we have we know the, the fantastic journey that what MCGM has been on for cloud uh, deployment. There would have been certain barriers to entry, you know, certain barriers to employing uh, cloud technology. <clears throat> what were they and what measures have you taken to, to provide a more enabling kind of framework uh, in, in MCGM? Uh, as it happens with many public public uh, sector offices, the initial barrier is, of course, various concerns around uh, the data security, piracy, increased threat to uh, the confidentiality or integrity uh, of data. Uh, besides that, uh, there are, I mean, there are certain concerns about the breach of issues. And typically in these organizations, once you put the data on cloud, then you feel that you have lost your administrative control. So those kinds of, uh, that kind of understanding is there. Besides, as Kanishka has said, sometimes you don't know what exactly you want to take on cloud, which you want to, uh, you know, deal, uh, handle at on-premise. So that kind of basic uh, orientation, understanding, capabilities, in-house capability, capabilities. There is also, these um, lackings are also there. 
and uh, another most important thing is the whole procurement process because unless there are uh, proper standardly set procurement processes it becomes a very trial and error uh, kind of a journey for us and uh, the the learning curve becomes very steep so these are the initial barriers once you get a handle on it and then you realize what exactly you want to do because in a municipal corporation like environment even when we adopted the erp but the real adoption by each and every department also takes time then certain things can't fit in the uh, erp environment so each department starts procuring their own uh, kind of applications and their own understanding then then bringing them together and having a common thread uh, among uh, all these initiatives that also becomes a challenge and that is a major challenge for uh, cloud technology apart from that what happens once you are on cloud sometimes you lose efficiency because the that you have so much of storage available with us and uh, that also happens so these these are the things which we are learning initially uh, these some of the things were neglected but over a period of time our uh, data that lake also got expanded and uh, uh, we need more and more uh, space on cloud then the efficiency has started creeping in but this is a long journey and this is a very steep uh, learning so these are uh, some of the uh, challenges but of course the measures taken uh, not only by bmc but even at a government level is basically to have robust policies and guidelines very clear directions in terms of data uh, security in terms of pro uh, procurement processes and plus the capability uh, enablement because not only at government of india level or meti level or the states uh, it department level but each and every organization needs uh, those uh, capabilities in house capabilities understanding their own problems what are the right solution right technology for uh, their own problems so this this is again even with involvement of uh, multiple consultants and uh, vendors also sometimes we grope in the dark and that clarity uh, it takes some time to, to get that clarity that what is the right kind of solution uh, for this problem so these are the initial uh, challenges but i think over a period of time with lot of uh, experience and uh, uh, your own understanding the in house uh, teams capacity building uh, now it has helped us uh, to have a clear uh, road map for us we have now in the process of having our own uh, it policy which was which is there but we are consolidating it and there is going uh, there is already the, the draft policy is ready we'll soon be publishing it and uh, we also have a complete chapter on what should be our cloud strategy uh, in that policy so uh, these new uh, technologies whatever uh, new is happening in terms of uh, not only on cloud platform but otherwise also and what is best suited for mcgm's requirements and with their citizen centric centric approach because finally uh, everything needs to be reflected in how efficiently uh, mcgm provides services to its citizens and manages its own business so i think uh, this learning is there and the barriers were there barriers are still there but uh, with our own learnings and help of uh, policies which are set up by mit also or the state government we are trying to deal with it thank you for thank that ma'am thank you ganesh uh, my next question now is uh, is more imminent or more regulatory based so with, with data localization almost imminent uh, how do you think the csp landscape uh, will evolve and adapt to these newer regulations if they are in place with the pdp bill and in the entire chapter on uh, on data localization what's your take on it sure sure i think uh, you know ashwini ma'am already touched some pieces of it as part as part of the you know the cloud strategy that mcgm is uh, adopting and the entire data pieces of which what pieces go on cloud what don't and that is really the fundamental piece on how the csp landscape will evolve uh, if you look at the data localization entire narrative and the bills that will come around it is really on how do you classify that data uh, who will be the controller of that data what are the data handling roles the responsibilities you know each of these would be fleshed out in detail and then the appropriate whatever the data protection obligations that come as part of this will also be uh, you know automatically contingent on each party uh, that is part of handling that data now once you've got that framework in place that's when any public sector organization will then be able to use say look you know here is my cloud deployment model uh, this is how i need my data to be leveraged here's the framework because it's already been defined uh, what kind of data will you handle which parts of data you can't handle what is your risk profile and that's how csp uh, will get classified accordingly in fact we 
we continue to see that a large number of CSPs, including third-party contractors, will start to seek a lot of robust security controls. Uh, they will want to you know, address all of these unauthorized third-party access to either data, systems, processes, assets, name what you may. Uh, they'll want to get their accreditations in place, whether it's ISO 27001 or ISO 27018, SOC, PCI, DC, DSS compliance, you know, all of these will start coming in place because what, the minute you start saying, well, the data has to be localized, then all of my data centers, whether they are in a hybrid mode, you know, uh, at a local zone, which is very close to a customer or an at edge, which is literally next to the customer or on cloud, uh, which could be slightly away from a customer, need to all comply to these um, accreditations and the same level of security uh, for the localization requirements. Now, you will still have certain government workloads that will be extremely classified at a highest level of sensitivity. Right? I, I mean, I could think of say, defense workloads or I could think of, let's say, even the country's taxpayer records. And these are very sensitive data that you would just say, well, you know, I need to have this data at my premise. And at that point in time, you could say, you know, let's, let's leverage a certain framework, whether it's the ISO 27018 to just define that data controller and processor requirement, because I could control the data in my data center, but I need it to be processed elsewhere. I don't have the processing capability for it. Take, um, you know, GSTN uh, data that today sits, right? There's a ton of GSTN data that is sitting, you know, possibly on premise, but how can I then start processing this on the cloud because of the immense compute power, the analytical capabilities, the ML capabilities that I can bring on top of it. And that's where governments will start working with the CSPs uh, to understand and apply all of these data protection uh, requirements. The last part that I want to bring in is the entire, the security conundrum around it, right? Which is how do you make sure while that data is at, is at transit or is on move uh, between your hybrid, your you know, on-premise data center to the cloud, uh, and then back uh, is continuously secure, and that's where the encryption pieces come in, right? You know, with public cloud, you do have the confidence of putting it out with encryption sir, keys, uh, where the customers completely control those encryption keys, and that's not going away. In fact, if not, it is going to be a lot more robust as we start uh, putting this out. So, I think this these are some of those areas where we'll start a lot of this landscape moving, including the partners that come with, let's say, with AWS, right? The third party providers that provide services on CSPs will continue to actually uh, build capabilities, especially around this area. And the other pieces, whether I'm deploying an ML solution, I'm deploying an analytic solution, I'm deploying a traditional data lake solution, they will continue to be there. But your value add will come in on how secure and how um, compliant are you to the laws of the land. Absolutely, absolutely, Kanesh. So uh, now coming back to uh, innovation and, and the improvements, uh, Madam, I would like to ask you uh, if you could help us in understanding where do you see the areas in, of improvement in cloud adoption and tech adoption in, in general in the government sector? And if there are any low hanging fruits that could be leveraged with minimal you know, <coughs> policy detours, um, if there are any innovation landscapes that BMC uh, has given the the advancements in, in, in the cloud tech. How has that particular thing evolved? What's your take on it now? In general, if you're talking about government, there are many agencies, government, which are sitting on a huge data, basically. So they need to uh, leverage that. And for that, they need to have a proper uh, cloud uh, strategy or uh, basically data, data leveraging strategy. So there are so many governments. I think BMC has taken its baby steps and it is uh, moving ahead. So right now, as I already told you, most of our uh, current uh, applications are the infrastructure as service. But there is a huge scope for platform as service, which envisages basically the complete development and uh, uh, deployment environment on the on the cloud itself. So that is one way. Then in addition to that, there is huge scope for software as service. So our current chatbot, which we have recently uh, launched the chatbot, as well as our uh, app, they could be uh, on that platform. And uh, there is huge scope for, again, um, there is so much of BMC's own data which could be uh, leveraged by using uh, various tools. There is scope for uh, AI, ML, 
uh, as well as uh, data analytics uh, even the robotic robotic uh, process automation is because many of our activities are automated uh, are could be automated so that robotic robotic process automation uh, is possible iot uh, is another way of doing it so we need to put because in in a organization a public sector organization most of the times things happen in uh, silos and then we have to uh, connecting this is how our journey starts but now having reached at a uh, certain level then we to have we need to have that vision and that is why we are coming with this holistic uh, it policy where we have the vision uh, for the entire organization and a road map how where uh, we want to uh, see ourselves and what kind of technology usage we want to uh, promote and encourage uh, our whole system and our whole team uh, towards the better citizen centric services and so that is what uh, we are working on if that ma'am uh, Ganesh, tell us about your successes tell us about aws wins and transformations that aws brought in india uh, it's going to be a little loaded so i'll keep it short because otherwise you know we'll, we'll just end up with a with a lot of space time on this sure. uh, but i think some of the key big stories um, and if today the entire vaccination we're very proud about it we're very humbled about it the entire vaccination effort that's been going on and the covin platform today runs on aws um, Coven platform when it was conceptualized and put out, you know, just before we opened it up from the 18 to 44 group, when when the government actually opened it up, it was running at about 6,000 requests per second uh, that were coming in on the app. Uh, the day they opened it, it hit 46,000 requests per second. Uh, on I think the 25th of, uh, but whenever that big event was, and I'll, yeah, you know, you'll have to correct me on the dates, but the big event when it happened it almost hit about 4 billion requests per second. And that is the scalability of cloud. It is a classic um, you, you know, example, a case study that is being touted all across the world. You know, an application that took um, 1.3 billion citizens across vaccination and didn't crash even once. Uh, and I think that's a true testimony to, to a make in India story as well, because the fact that we had um, our local developers working on a cloud platform, the cloud platform was able to scale up, scale down, was able to bring in multiple uh, other factors into play, and, and it kept on iterating. Look at the Coven app, um, you know, when about say 18 months prior, and look at what it is today, right? The portal itself. There have been iterated, iterations that have been made on the uh, application, and that's a very agile way that it has gone through. Uh, that is one. E Sanjeevni, uh, the entire teleconsultation that today happens again was uh, a part of, uh, you know, on the AWS cloud. And again, the, during the COVID times when people couldn't visit hospitals, needed primary care uh, or needed a secondary opinion on a particular health condition, could, could just call up uh, doctors and doctors would go ahead and respond to that. Uh, incidentally, in fact, uh, when Ashwini ma'am was, uh, you know, heading the BMC war room, there was the entire NASCOM effort. Uh, yeah. where the industry got together, right? And Vibhu, you were a part of that as well, yeah. where the entire industry got together and said, you know, can we actually put out a data platform on which the dashboards can be built on and then get insights? Because you should know that that month of April and May were probably one of the key, most chaotic months for a lot of our lives. I, I wouldn't make that as an understatement at all. It was a chaotic month. We didn't know where it was happening. And I, I clearly remember when I was looking at the BMC dashboards and there used to be a Dadar cluster coming up and there used to be a Kalba Devi cluster coming up and you had to correlate, okay, you know, how is this entire thing working through? Can I drive any contact tracing out of it? Can I know where is my next cluster going to come up? How do I make sure that at some point in time when we had abandoned the contact tracing part, but making sure that actually equipment and medical equipment was there immediately when a cluster was uh, found. Now, all of this was possible because of the power of all of this data coming in in a in a more seamless consolidated fashion i'm i'm, I'm extremely uh, glad i was part of that effort uh, along with many other industry uh, uh, you know champions i think as nascom uh, kudos that you guys could bring together a lot of us while we compete in a commercial sense but for, you know over there it all came together as a as a true single one industry partnership um, you know, taking away from the entire healthcare piece, there is work that today we do in the agri space. Uh, there is crop in that is working to just provide a lot of data to farmers that helps them make their agri produce better. Satsha that is providing geospatial data. 
uh, again to farmers for them to get uh, a better uh, prediction on their weather, uh, on what could be the next crop sowing season or when is the right time to sow a crop, right? And and these are direct interventions that are being made because the, there are workloads today running on cloud. And I, I think that's where most of the uh, you know, successes have been coming. While there has been plenty of work that's been going on in education, in healthcare, uh, and we've got partnerships that today run with multiple organizations, uh, whether it's with Intel, where we're working uh, to solve for diabetic retinopathy, or whether we're working with, uh, say, a, a step one, which is trying to solve uh, as an NGO, it is trying to solve for, again, teleconsultation, but to a larger platform. I mean, these are ways where we think we can make a significant impact for every citizen uh, of India. Thanks for that, uh, Kanesh. Staying with you, Kanesh, uh, my, my, my final question to you, uh, since you talked about COVID, since you talked about the, the NASCOM experience, since you talked about coming of uh, coming of age of all the competitors together to solve one problem for the for the greater good of humanity, what's your vision for uh, for the India growth story in cloud tech? And how do you believe that uh, the next wave of tech disruptions are going to shape up uh, the industry and, and the Indian landscape? Uh, so, you know, as much as we want to uh, say there is another wave of tech disruption that's coming in, I think what's happened is and it, the COVID wave actually helped a lot of the tech disruption wave. A lot of things that we couldn't have accomplished over the last five, eight, ten years were actually accomplished in months uh, when we got to COVID. Uh, number of public sector organizations started understanding that, well, you had to adopt and move very quickly. Uh, think of it, right? Where during the 2020 April to June timeframe, when everybody was working from home, who would go to a data center and manage it? There is nobody sitting in the data center, right? But if suddenly when you had cloud, it became so much easier for you to move uh, and develop on those because everybody was working from home. Uh, that was one. Second is, yeah, you know, the overall landscape in India is also now slowly getting to a, a digi digital economy landscape. And that is also accelerating a lot of this uh, effort today. Uh, take any industry, you know, and these are, I'm, I'm talking about new age industries, right? Whether you're talking about drones, high performance computing, uh, there's work that's now happening in quantum computing, there is manufacturing industry that is leveraging a number of these, um, you know, interventions. I think each of these are helping move the needle further. Um, Niti Aayog, for example, is right now working with us and they've put up something called a cloud innovation center. And this is the policy think tank of India that has put very specific um, innovation modules, innovation challenges around cloud innovation uh, and, and making that as a key focus for the government policy and government direction. Uh, take Digi Yatra, uh, Digi Yatra, which will shortly come out and essentially your face will be your boarding pass when you move to an airport. Uh, you will no longer have a boarding pass to carry on. And, and think how, how great it is for a country like India with that many number of variables as we put out any solution out to have such a cutting edge solution when you go through an airport, which most other countries, in fact, I don't think of any other country at that scale would have even achieved it. So you know, the Digi Yatra challenge will essentially be you to have your face as a biometric. The airport will have your details. Again, this could be a hybrid strategy where you are able to download this at the airport. As soon as you pass through it, the CIFSF agent knows your face, uh, knows who you are. You're able to put your bags, you're able to board the aircraft, pick your bags when you disembark and move on. And all of this journey is done through cloud. And it's a very seamless way of uh, getting that across, right? Uh, so I think there is definitely a, a number of areas that we will see that will get adopted on cloud. Uh, if you're talking about even blockchain for that instance, um, blockchain will also be a very cloud centric story. You cannot do blockchain on a non cloud on premise uh, system. So we will see each of these make a major impact on India's journey uh, across sectors. And, and I think the next five years will be extremely uh, exponential as far as digi economy growth is concerned. Okay. My final question to you, ma'am, just to wrap it up. Uh, what is the support that you require from the industry, from private sector, that you like to see in the short term to the medium term to enhance the tech experience at uh, uh, at your department? As Kanishka has rightly mentioned, at government of India level, with the involvement of uh, industry and private sector, so many new initiatives are coming up, and the whole COVID 
uh, on that Covin app, the way it was managed, or up other uh, initiatives like uh, the Jam Portal, MyGov, and then upcoming uh, initiatives like the e-passport or uh, this Dijayatra, they show the uh, basically how both private sector and government can come together and uh, leverage uh, the strengths of cloud technology. I think the similar thing we expect at the municipal uh, governance level as well, because at times what happens. Uh, we know that some most of these technologies uh, or tech solutions are uh, oriented towards private sector because they are basically there to solve the problems of private sector or to bring in efficiency. They are more akin to the processes which are followed there. While the government processes are at times different and it becomes very difficult to adopt them directly. And that is where we need uh, support from uh, the industry because we also experience the same in, in COVID. Whatever, everybody became more tech savvy. Sometimes even private sector helps us. We come up with new solutions, but our own departments are not ready to adopt it. We have in BMC, typically we had one health uh, infrastructure management system, which we couldn't implement successfully in last seven years. But during COVID, you know, everybody wanted that because of uh, the problems which were surrounding us. And then uh, our own department also participated. The, the vendor also uh, helped us, the technology uh, provider also became flexible and we made it a, a success story. Our own COVID, uh, COVID dashboard or whatever we did uh, to basically to create that dashboard, there also again, a lot of uh, industry uh, people, a lot of private sector guys, they helped us voluntarily in the initial phase, later on on commercial basis, but they gave us the right solution. They suggested us the right way to go ahead. I think that kind of uh, sharing of trust is needed between uh, government and uh, the industry because as far as India's tech story is concerned and if we have to really leverage it for the uh, well-being of the common uh, being, then probably commercial interest should be kept aside, but uh, joining of hands in the right manner is very much required. So especially the government bodies, local bodies, because they don't have in-house capacities, where the industry support to us in right advice, right solution for the right problem, what are the options available and how wisely we should choose uh, out of those options. That is very much required, that strong support and the right technology uh, and promotion of that right technology is also required because at times we don't get the quality uh, people, the quality service because and uh, we are left to choose while we are not uh, in the right frame of mind to choose the best option. So. The, the kind of capacities which probably a private industry would have, uh, government industry, government uh, bodies, each and every government body may not have. So there we, uh, I think the industry and uh, bodies like NASCOM also, as well as uh, the various uh, individual partners in this uh, IT uh, or the cloud uh, sector, they can help uh, government to set up a, a proper platform. Uh, which will be more efficient, which will be more resilient, which will be more citizen friendly. That is that handholding, uh, that sharing of trust, that is what I expect from the industry. Absolutely, absolutely, ma'am. Mrs. Ashwini Bide and uh, Kanishka Agiwal, thank you very much for taking time from your busy schedules and providing valuable insights and perspectives. And I'm sure that the discussions that we have today will lead to creating better synergies between government and industry going forward for cloud adoption. In this series of government roundtables planned under the NASCOM Cloud Advocacy Program, do stay tuned for more for more of such enlightening discussions. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Vibhu. Thank you, Kanishka. Thank, Thank you. So you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Vibhu. Thank you.